Welcome to Bring the World Home, a production of Returned Peace Corps Volunteers of Hawaii. My name is Deborah Ball, and I served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Niger, West Africa. I'll be your host for today's program. We're going to be sharing with you our Peace Corps volunteers' experience from abroad, and we'd like to share a message of love, friendship, family, and people of different cultures. Today with us is Chip Tilton, who served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Malaysia. Hey, Chip. How are you this afternoon, Deborah? I'm pretty good. Well, I'm happy to be here talking about a subject near to both of our hearts, uh, service in the Peace Corps. Could you show us on this map um, where we are, where you served in relationship to Hawaii? I sure can. This is, uh, of course, arrow pointing to Hawaii out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And Malaysia is um, pretty much on the same latitude a little bit further, quite a ways west, about 3,000 miles west. The peninsula of Malaysia is uh, uh, part of the Indochina uh, peninsula of Southeast Asia. Malaysia is, uh, also incorporates the island of Borneo. There's two states on the island of Borneo in addition to the um, 11 states in the peninsula of Malaysia. I went there in 1966. Um, actually, January of 1967, I entered training in, in 1966 and uh, trained in Los Angeles, California, at California State University of Los Angeles. But there's quite a connection between Hawaii and the Peace Corps because in that era, the, the early years of the Peace Corps, uh, much training was accomplished here in Hawaii over on the Big Island of Hawaii in Waipio Valley. They had a major facility and many volunteers that went all over the world trained here in Hawaii. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to. <laughs> why don't we back up and why don't you tell us a little bit about how you decided, how did you choose to become a Peace Corps volunteer? What uh, motivated you to apply? And um, how did you get selected for Malaysia? Well, for me, the uh, process was started, honestly, as a lark. I was a... Uh, uh, sophomore in college at the University of Arizona in Tucson, Arizona, and um, I was studying biology. I wanted to be a marine biologist, and the summer of, the, uh, of my sophomore year, I was going to work as a um, researcher on a project at uh, Woods Hole Institute of Oceanography. My last uh, week or two on campus, uh, the Peace Corps was there recruiting, and they had wonderful pictures of uh, Micronesia. They were recruiting for projects in Micronesia and uh, I saw the recruiting table, spoke with the recruiters, saw the beautiful pictures of Micronesia which of course would look looks kind of like Hawaii uh, and I, as a fluke thought of that I would put in an application which I did and went off to my summer job uh, with Woods Hole down in uh, Mexico and uh, I didn't uh, I, I soon got word that I wasn't selected for training in Micronesia. I was young and at that time and um, most of the Peace Corps volunteers uh, had to be college graduates. Um, I didn't think much about it because it wasn't something that I was really counting on. But um, So how did, you, how did you feel when you found out you were selected to go? Well, several uh, at the end of the summer I got an invitation out of the blue. In fact, I got a telegram asking me to go if I would consider joining a training program to go to Malaysia to teach um, shop subjects on an elementary school level and I had two weeks to make a decision I had just a few days to make a decision and I had to be in a training in two weeks time uh, apparently evaluating my application etc. And this was still during the summer when this you were? This was still during the uh -huh. summer and so I got to exciting news and I had never honestly never even heard of Malaysia and uh, of course they gave a description of what the country was all about and what the 
work was going to be, what the training was involved. The whole uh, package of information, of course, came, and it was an exciting time. Two days later, in 1966, I got a draft notice because I hadn't gone registered for school again. So to make uh, uh, things really nice for my life, the Peace Corps uh, won out over my Selective Service Board, and I, as I said, immediately entered training in California. We learned, and this is typical, I'm sure, uh, as a volunteer, it's similar to your experience, you learn many things about the country. You have uh, exposure. In fact, we had a number of people from Malaysia that were there teaching us language, intensive language training every day, cultural um, values and cultural practices. Uh, learning about the food, in addition to learning how to do the job that we were going to be doing. And this was in California? This was in California, yes. And uh, all of my group, which was Malaysia 15, was the 15th group that was going to be going into Malaysia, was uh, all going to be teachers, and everybody was going to be teaching in the elementary level shop classes, like wood shop, basic drafting, um, basic mechanics with um, small engines, this sort of thing. Um, I was the youngest person in the group by far. How old were you? Uh, I was, at that time, actually, I was only 19 years old. 19. So, Chip, how did it feel um, at 19 years old to be heading off to a country you'd never been to before, you'd only just heard of, and you knew you were going to serve there for two years? Well, it was, of course, it was very exciting, but one of the to me, one of the great things about the Peace Corps is the training period. I don't know how much they do it to this day, but there was a lot of learning about each other. And uh, being invited to go to the Peace Corps at, in that era was just the first step, actually. There was a final selection to be made at, at actually several points along the three-month trading process. So there was a bit of tension as to whether or not you were actually going to go to country. Whether so you, you kind of had selected. to prove yourself uh -huh. uh, as you went along uh, at v in various areas. Learn obviously, you had to show that you were learning what was being exposed to you. You also had to show to the Peace Corps that you were stable enough and relaxed enough, I guess, uh, to be a goodwill ambassador for the United States, which is one of the primary functions uh, of the Peace Corps. So let me ask you, um, when you first arrived in the country, did the Peace Corps have it set up that you had a host family, or what was your immediate context when you got there? When we got in country, we had uh, two days in the capital city of Kuala Lumpur, and um, uh, where we got acclimated, we met the uh, district directors uh, that would, we would be working with, it would be our contact with, uh, for the Peace Corps. We had, uh, were given our assignments, uh, and um, just to backtrack slightly, I, I mentioned earlier that most that everybody was training to teach in a uh, elementary school, uh, really would be equivalent of middle school level uh, shop classes. But several of us were pulled out of that basic stream, and and we were going to be teaching on the high school level at a at a trade school, which was newly formed by the Malaysian government, funded by the Canadian government, was going to be uh, mostly staffed by Peace Corps volunteers. Uh, so we got that assignment in country, and uh, we were trained for that. We got the assignment, and then we were told, to <laughs> uh, directed down to the bus station, told to catch a bus where we would be going uh, on about a four-hour ride across the country uh, from one side to the other to our town and, uh, and the volunteers that were there, which there was about five or six volunteers already in the city doing different types of work, public health, other kinds of education, community building, agriculture, and these types of projects that were common uh, in that era of the Peace Corps. Uh, so to you, were, you show basically us got, got an overview of, of what was happening in Absolutely. the country. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think you have a picture of the trade school that you worked in. I do sure do. Uh, this is actually from a magazine, uh, the yearbook that the uh, uh, school put together. In and, 1967. Uh, in 1967, like I said, this was a brand new school uh -huh. and it was the first class to ever go through the school. In fact, when I got to the facility, my shop was um, still in boxes. Uh, the school was 
two complexes, actually, as you can see here in the photograph. There's, there's an area here. This was one school. This was my school. And then this was another trade school adjacent to it. So it looks like you have um, several different buildings. All this is for the, what kind of trades were you doing? Well, the trades were power mechanics, electronics, electrical, uh, metalworking, welding, and the building trades. Um, the schools were established to, as part of a five-year, initial five-year program of Malaysia to create a blue-collar workforce to bring them into, squarely into the 20th century. So at this complex we had shops and classrooms and, and, and the students were streamed uh, kind of uh, following the British system, the, what they call the form system, and uh, basically there were children that couldn't cut it theoretically in the academic stream. And so, so they had an extra opportunity. At this they, instead of uh, just letting them uh, go off and, and do nothing, they wanted to train them to, to be productive in, uh, in the Different progressing trades. society of Malaysia, much as we did, much as the United States did in the, in the early part of our history. Well, Chip, I'd like to hear a little bit more about your personal experience. Could you okay. talk a little bit about um, what were your relationships like with um, your host family, and how did that feel initially when you first got there, and sort of how did that develop during well, your time there? Um, initially, when, when we first arrived, we were housed and we were given a house in the school. So four of us volunteers lived in a, in a home on the school campus and we uh, interacted with the other teachers there who were, um, uh, now Malaysia has a, a diverse population. It's uh, about well, 50 or 60, per, about 55 to 60 percent Malay, about 30 percent Chinese, uh, the balance Indian and, and other people. So the school that you were working with, a lot of your... your our, our fellow teachers, teachers were, were all different. ...reflected that population break, breakdown primarily. Uh -huh. And um, and your host family was... No, we didn't live with the host family. Oh, you family. didn't have a host so this family. this was a use, unique thing for our group. Uh -huh. And uh, so af after three or four months of being there, we were we felt kind of cheated, we meaning myself and the other volunteers. So we... Uh, we found uh, living quarters out in the community um, that we, uh, I ended up sharing a home with another school teacher, uh, an Indian, uh, Indian man of, uh, who happened to be a Muslim religion, which is kind of unusual there, and he was an elementary school teacher. Uh, his name was Kasim Abdul bin Majid, and uh, we lived in a little village out in the jungle where there was uh, seven other school teachers living in, in little uh, one-room apartments, basically. And uh, they called the villages kampongs there. And so we had our little kampong, and it was uh, uh, all teachers except for three other families that lived there. So it was, it was kind of uh, equivalent to living with a family, uh, except it was our fellow group of teachers who uh, were all host country nationals. And what were some of the, um, could you give me an example of some of the cultural um, differences that you encountered as you were living together, and particularly um, any humorous experiences you might have had? <laughs> well, there was, uh, uh, certainly for, for us as Americans, the culture of living in a, in a jungle village was different uh, from, now we didn't bathe in a stream, they had water, uh, there was a municipal water service, but it came in in the form of a, of a faucet in your uh, patio area of, of the home and you had a small cistern and you would fill that up from the, from the city water supply and then you would take a shower by dipping a bucket into the cistern and dousing yourself with icy cold water <laughs> to take a shower. Did you have some privacy for this? Or? There was privacy uh -huh. but uh, it, where we were, but uh, that was not necessarily, it wasn't particularly common and most of the villages, most of the kampongs around the, the area which was basically rural. The town of Kwantan was a population of about 10,000 at that time. Um, people had a single water supply and they would go there to bathe in public and you had to learn how to bathe in within a 
uh, sarong that mm. you would wear. Mm -mm. And uh, so... Did that ever fall off while you were taking your... <laughs> well, we, not the... Not the uh, I experienced, fortunately. I was very uh, particular to, to uh, f again, because most of the people in that area were Muslim, we, we wanted to show um. proper respect and, uh, and be on top of, of uh, things that might be offensive to them. So I always took a double wrap and put a belt Make around Make sure it's tight. <laughs> no accidents would occur. <laughs> Some of the other differences, of course, was the food was very different. Uh, People there don't you know, use utensils typically to eat with, except the Chinese culture. But the Malays and the Indians use their hand to eat. And of course, they use a lot of rice. They don't have plates. They use banana leaves, typically. And um, so all of that was great fun and, and just uh, uh, seemed totally natural. Uh, one of the things as a Peace Corps volunteer is you, you're advised to try and be as open as possible and, and in my experience when you are uh, when you leave yourself open to that opportunity all the good things come to you as, as you know from I, I was just thinking of the the use of the hands in Niger I also would eat with my hands mm -hmm. and um, I'm sure that there was something similar in Malaysia you had to eat with your right hand because your left hand was used uh, after you went to the bathroom. Yes. And so it would be a great insult as you're sharing a big pot of food if you started eating with your left hand. Absolutely. So you had to be very, very certain you were eating with your right hand. Well, that's where the, where the fine uh, training that the Peace Corps gives us uh, prior to going in country is, is becomes invaluable. <laughs> Hopefully you don't make any of these social faux pas and you're able to um, fit in and be, a, be recognized as, as a uh, interesting part of the community. And Chip, I see you brought some stuff here. Can you, can you describe what these are used for and show us well, these utensils? As in many countries around the world, these are a couple of knives. And uh, in of themselves, they're, they're kind of an interesting design. But uh, the reason that I brought them is the people of Malaysia uh, were very inventive. Um, now, Malaysia at that time in the 60s had uh, the second highest standard of living in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, the people were very uh, inventive with what they did, uh, uh, which was to us, coming from the United States, very interesting. They would make a funnel uh, for transferring kerosene from a, from a uh, five-gallon tin into their lamps for light at home out of old beer cans and soda cans. They would cut them up and mm. then re-solder them and make these little hand pumps to transfer Very resourceful. fuel. And this is another example. Mm -hmm. uh, they did this with all kinds of things. I found this very interesting because they took old automobile and truck springs and reforged them to make the blades out of this. Of course, the spring so, steel was so this hold a is, nice edge. So that's from the, the truck. The that's spring of a truck, the leaf spring of a truck. And the end here is also? And then this is just wood. This that's is a natural wood. hardwood that they would turn that's on a little that. hand lathe with some brass uh, ferrules to hold it Looks the very hand piece strong, in, in place. It is strong, and they, uh, this is, a, a, in essence, would be a machete, two different types of uh, cutting instruments that they would use in the field or in the jungle. Then maybe they would use it for harvesting rice. Maybe they would use it to cut fruit from a tree, uh, cut their way through certain areas of, of growth. Of course, uh, in the jungle, most um, uh, there's not much undergrowth. It's not like in the movies where you have to chop your way through to get uh, to, to make passage through the jungle. Uh, you have a canopy way up in the air, and the, and the jungle floor is really quite open. Uh, so that, that's just an example of a cottage industry uh, where, where people would uh, take something and, and not discard it. They would recycle it, probably one of the best examples of recycling that uh, uh, we saw over and over again in many different ways in, in Malaysia. Could you tell me, um, Chip, a time that you ha found very challenging during your two years in volunteer, uh, volunteering in Malaysia, and how you, um, how you were able to continue through that and not just want to turn around and go back home? Well, for me, uh, I didn't have much of that uh, feeling. It was a great adventure, and I bought into every second of it. Uh -huh. It was uh, just a delight to be there, everybody that I encountered. Uh, thought Americans were great. 
Malaysia was a former British colony, and they didn't care too much for the British, but they loved Americans, and they, everybody that I met was eager to uh, speak with us, find out what they could about the country. Um, we s spoke Malay language, but mm -hmm. many people spoke English quite well, again, because it was a former British colony. And, uh, and what about, who were some of your closest friends while you were there? Was it the teachers you were hanging out with? My roommate was a, a very close friend, and, and the other teachers in my little group were close friends. Um, and then people that they associated with in the community, their friends, also became my friends. And uh, I was very fortunate to be part of a, of a wide social circle of young bachelors, if you will, in uh, Malaysia. And um, we, of course, tried to do, we interfaced with the other volunteers in the community who were doing different things. And we would try to put, perhaps they were, not perhaps, some of them were more isolated in where they lived and what the type of work that they were doing. And so. Uh, as a matter of course, we would try and, and come up with group uh, support so that uh, we could expand the uh, exposure of the host country nationals to more Americans and, more, and the diversity that existed. And one, one interesting thing of our project in particular was we were one of the first groups in the Peace Corps to have to, uh, a number of our members came from the Job Corps. Mm. which was uh, starting out in that era. And we had five or six people from inner city backgrounds, uh, New York, Chicago, Detroit, et cetera, uh, who were in Malaysia and trying to uh, do their job. And also, uh, there was a lot of social unrest back in the United States, and, and people were curious. And they would ask us, us Caucasians, us as we say here in Hawaii, you know, what's, what's the problem? I mean, if you, it uh, seems like a lot of Americans don't uh, care for Afri African Americans or Negroes as they uh, were known back then, uh, were typically called, you know, their skin is just as dark as ours. What, does that mean you don't like us? So this was the kind of difficult situations that uh, um, I wasn't that prepared for personally, because uh, where I grew up uh, in Arizona, we, uh, my mother taught in a Spanish language school, and I grew up with Chicanos, and it wasn't uh, really in my realm of thinking. So it forced me to, be, to examine what was going on at home in many ways and try and explain it as best I could. And um, uh, that, made us, that made me closer to the people that I was dealing with, because they could see that uh, there was a, a, an honesty that volunteers brought to uh, their work in the country. And what, what do you feel you gained from your Peace Corps experience that you could bring back when you returned to the States? What I brought back uh, is something that I still utilize to this day, and that is an appreciation for people uh, all over the world and the appreciation of how similar we are. Um, I've done a lot of community work since I've come back, and uh, I've tried to uh, share the view that other countries have of the United States with people that I've worked with in the communities that I've lived in since I've, I've been back. And that's been in areas as diverse as Arizona, Los Angeles, here in Hawaii, other parts of the United States. and. Uh, the main thing that I utilize on a weekly or monthly basis is, is the ability to work together with people, to ac accept people at face value, and give them the respect that we all deserve as human beings, first off, and learn how our differences can be utilized to our mutual benefit. We all have something to bring to the table, and that was a great lesson for me to learn and to experience because I was just barely beyond teenage years, and I was teaching on the high school level to teenagers, giving them a background that would prepare them for the rest of their life as a career, as a mechanic, and, um, and I learned tremendous things from them 
to be able to share when I got back and I went into teaching here, um, to be able to share with people in the community how these people from another country actually think just like us. They might eat differently, but they still have to eat and they have the same concerns about their future and about their families as we do. Well, Chip, thank you very much for sharing with us tonight. Um, as we're wrapping up our program, I'd just like to ask one more question. How, um, how does living in Hawaii um, resonate with your experience in, the, in Malaysia? Is there anything uh, that you feel that uh, brought you to Hawaii because of your experience in Malaysia or that you use insights you had from Malaysia that you use in Hawaii? Um, there, there are a lot of similarities, actually. Um, uh, the Hawaiian culture has uh, a, a great, to my mind anyways, a great similarity to uh, the Malay culture in, in many ways, a respect for, for your surroundings, a respect for the land, uh, a respect for your ancestors. So that was very powerful. The spirituality of the country, of the peoples there, not only the Malays, but the Chinese and the Indians, is very similar to the value system that, that we find in Hawaii and our different cultures here, the f people from the Philippines, people from China, Japan, etc., all have this, uh, a lot of uh, sincerity of life. Sincerity of life. Well, we're going to close with that, Chip, and thank you very much for joining oh, thank us Thank you on very our much program. for having me, Deborah. That's our program for today. Please join us next time when we visit another country and bring the world home. Aloha.